Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, or uh, very early good morning to you if you're if you are uh, joining from uh, Japan or somewhere else in East Asia. Um, welcome to the uh, second day of the workshop, uh, Decade of Fukushima: uh, Socio-Technical Perspectives on Surviving the Nuclear Age, Japan. Um, once again, I'm Tim Oaks, and the director of Center for Asian Studies. Uh, co-organizer of, of this workshop. Um, and I will be serving as um, kind of the, uh, I guess you could call me the MC <laughs> for um, today's uh, event. I'll, um, I'm going to be doing some uh, discussing, uh, introducing people, um, and I'll try my best to moderate um, questions in the chat um, that come up. I'll, I'll clarify a few housekeeping issues here in a minute, but before that I do that, I just want to uh, once again, thank um, uh, Liza Williams at the Center for Asian Studies for her uh, support, uh, making sure everything has gone smoothly and so far it's gone great. Uh, we and, and we had a um, great evening last night. I hope you were uh, able to join us um, for Professor Miyazaki's uh, keynote um, last night. Uh, it was a great start and we hope to continue that momentum and a lot of the themes that came up in that discussion um, through the paper presentations that we have today. Um, in addition to thanking Liza, I also want to, of course, acknowledge the Albert Smith Nuclear Age Fund uh, for the funding that has made this workshop and the broader project that this is part of um, possible. Um, just in terms of a few brief uh, housekeeping details, um, we will have the chat open um, and you, uh, anyone is free to enter any questions in the chat um, if they want. Uh, we will be prioritizing uh, workshop participants in terms of um, their being able to ask questions, uh, raise their hands, turn on their video, uh, uh, unmute themselves, those kinds of things so we can have um, hopefully more of a semblance of a discussion among the workshop participants. But we, of course, do welcome um, audience, uh, questions from everybody else entered in the chat and I'll do my best to get to those. As usual, um, we will have limited time um, with all these papers and presentations. Um, and so if we don't get to everyone's questions, my apologies uh, again um, in advance. Um, and so that's, a, uh, and I, last night I put in the chat the link to the, um, uh, the program, um, which gives the order and it has uh, of, of the events today. And it also provides um, abstracts and bios of the, of the speakers. Um, we will put that again in, Liza, if you could put that in the chat again um, for people's reference, if they don't have that right in front of them, that would be helpful. Um, and before we start, um, Kate, is there anything I'm missing uh, or is anything you want to add uh, before we jump into things? No, just um, thanks for coming today and being part of the conversation. It's really a pleasure to engage with these papers and to and thank you for um, to my colleagues here at CU for acting as discussants today. Looking forward to the conversation. Great. OK, um, well, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Professor Rio um, Morimoto, who will be our first uh, presenter today. Um, and then I will follow his presentation with um, some of my own discussion comments. Um, and this will be the pattern that we, that we do for all the presentations today. Uh, we'll follow them with a discussion comment and then offer the speaker a chance to respond and then we'll open it up to broader discussion and, and questions. Um, so Professor uh, uh, Ryo Morimoto is a first generation scholar from Japan and an assistant professor of anthropology at Princeton University. Before joining Princeton, he was a postdoctoral fellow and a project manager of the Japan Disaster Digital Archive at the Reichauer Institute of Japanese Studies um, at Harvard University. As a 2020, 2021 member of the Social and, uh, School of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Study, he is finishing his book project uh, entitled The Nuclear Ghost, Atomic Livelihood in Fukushima's Gray Zone. And some of the material that we'll be hearing from him today is, um, I believe, uh, coming out of that project as well. So, Rio, the floor is yours. Thank you so much um, for the kind introduction and for this, you know, um, giving me this venue to um, talk about. And I actually 
I want to say that, you know, this uh, particular event given me an opportunity to experiment with my own work. Uh, because uh, as I got the invitation, I wasn't sure how I could engage. And I thought about, well, why don't I try doing something different than usual? And, you know, if you had a chance to uh, take a look, uh, what I did is to experiment with my colleague called Ethnographic Lettering. Um, Lawrence Ralph is the person. Um, and, you know, in the decade of Fukushima, and I, you know, was thinking about my own relationship to 311, especially after um, Professor Nizaki's uh, talk yesterday. So I figured maybe I can just share a little bit of how I came to um, study this thing and then still sticking to it. Um, so my first encounter with uh, 311 was uh, in the coast coastal area of uh, Iwate when I um, went there to volunteer basically to clean up. And, you know, of course I had never been to the area. I come from Western Japan. And then the first thing I saw when I got out of the volunteer bus was this uh, really the pitch black field. It's like, there's nothing that you can tell but other than like black things. And as we had gotten off the bus, and I pushed to the field, the everything cleared up and then the color started to appear because all these uh, flies that are going after the um, washed off frozen fish, which was released from the factory nearby, basically became the site for flies to come and then propagate, right? So my first experience of 311 was, was this like, <laughs> you know, um, flies and the smells and all this kind of stuff that, that didn't go away from my nose for a long, long time. And then since then, like I moved from Iwate to Miyagi. And then in 2013, I finally arrived in the coastal part of Fukushima after fighting a lot with uh, many people in Japan and in the US about, you know, um, not going to that area because uh, people basically warned me um, saying that uh, it might not be um, good for me. And then the reason why I went there all had to do with the fact that there were people still living and I was very much interested the reason why people were staying despite all this discussion about the potential threat of contamination from that area. Um, so that's uh, when my field work started. And then, you know, the, my actual field work uh, was something that changed my own understanding of a nuclear accident or living with uh, low dose radiation exposure. And then, in this particular um, letter I put together is uh, where I tried to um, have a conversation with uh, one of my interlocutor. Um, the person who I ended up calling grandma, um, who I, you know, um, met and in 2013. And since then, like I basically was um, at times like living with her and her family. And the reason why I thought of writing a letter to her, partly because uh, she recently passed away um, and I hadn't been able to visit um, her um, or the altar to give her um, some uh, offering um, because of the COVID. And um, this particular, uh, I guess, event gave me the opportunity to think about what was it that you know she helped me to understand about this particular disasters or what it means to live and then die while in the contaminated region. Um, and I think, you know, um, what I put together kind of speaks to uh, the presentation yesterday about like how we think about the intangible sort of damage or the loss, or, you know, or in the ways that, that we can kind of try to communicate or even engage or even to try to hear what um, residents have to say about this thing. And, you know, if you had a read, the letter, um, this is just my attempt to sort of uh, not to um, 
not to say that if you don't know the area that you would not understand. Um, because that there's a delicate balance of like, well, you know, you've been to Fukushima, you talked to somebody there, therefore you have a right to talk about it, right? And I just really didn't want to have that kind of attitude when I was, in a way, complaining about how we've been approaching this issue, right? But I wanted to give a, um, some venue for us, all of us to be able to relate to some extent about, you know, what would happen when your familiar place uh, becomes an area where other people imagine to be uninhabitable. So I would just like, you know, for those of you who didn't have the chance to um, take a look, I would just like read the brief excerpt of um, what I wrote. And then maybe you can get some sense of um, what's happening. And then again, this uh, person I'm writing letter to is you know, was, um, you know, an uh, old lady in her 70s when I met and then became turns 80s or so, but she was an evacuee from, um, you know, mandatory evacuation zone who decided to remain in the same city so she can attend to her evacuated town. So I'll just read a little bit. As Hiroshi Kainuma puts it, post fallout Fukushima is difficult to tell. There is no one truth, one reality, one narrative that could capture all that has happened since March 2011. Some people left Fukushima and never came back. Around 195 children and young adults have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer, and others died from the tsunami or the long-term evacuation. Simultaneously, Many struggle with alcoholism, mental health issues, and the secondary health problems. Some died by suicide because of the loss of hope or financial and other struggles. And others profited from the, the accident. Depending on perspective, various images of Hokushima emerge. Grandma, I feel compelled to say this because I feel that academic and public discourses have homogenized Fukushima and its people as the damaged. I have been exposed to perspectives of people like you who remain in the region despite the threat of radiation exposure. Highlighting your situated narratives in this letter, however, I do not downplay the importance of radiological contamination. Instead, the problem you help me see is how contamination has become the primary optic used by the government, experts, and the public alike for rendering coastal Fukushima and its people visible and invisible. You taught me that contamination has not been and should not remain the only problem of the region or the only approach to nuclear-related issues. As Haruki Murakami puts it, quote, violence does not always take visible form and not all wounds gush blood, end quote. Radiation exposure can cause cancer. The post fallout Fukushima policies seems to be driven by this dictum. And I feel that the policies are there to prevent residents from claiming this particular physical harm from the technical accident. Grandma, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Protecting your house was how the government justified your long-term evacuation, sleep deprivation, and the wrecking of your home and land. When you are confronted with this dominant radiation-centered narrative, you would say nothing but purse your lips together. I witnessed your purse lips over and over and over during our times together. With your pursed lips, you endured and resisted a perspective that only attended to your losses, sufferings, and anger while ignoring your hopes and desires. I know that you suffered and you were angry and sad. Still, those experiences themselves do not define who you are or what it meant for you to live in post fallout coastal Fukushima. I remember a gigantic smile on your face when your great grand 
store or a visit it for you the first time from Tokyo. We are very proud to take her to see the Millennium Old Samurai Horse Festival in the region. I also witnessed the sheer joy when you found out that your homegrown plums are not contaminated. You were elated not because you could eat them, but because you could share your pickled plums with others. That was how you made new friends around your temporary residence and trying to repair and maintain the existing ties with family, relatives, friends, and neighbors damaged by the typical accident. Grandma, you showed me how people could still enjoy and find meaning in life despite the threat of chronic low-dose radiation exposure. People like you should no longer be made to purse their lips and endure. So in this 10th year, let me call for suspending radiological damage to explore different Fukushima than how it has been imagined and entertained. So that's just a little piece uh, from him. Um, if you can tell, um, what I'm trying to do here is to um, uh, engage with an indigenous studies scholarship, uh, in particular, uh, it talks um, or Churchill and then uh, when on, um, others that talk about or the community of people who have been going through this experience for a long time. And when I uh, follow their suggestions and then try to suspend damage and then look at the residents' hopes and desire, what I came to see is the importance of uh, addressing this um, issue of the attachment to land or the livelihood that particular way of living enable for those people that decontamination unfortunately end up illuminating. So um, I guess what I'm trying to um, you know, um, talk with you all is that I, you know, is my concern that if we only approach um, Fukushima issue as the problem of contamination that end up uh, reproducing or enabling the same sort of, um, you know, technological optimism, which, you know, argues that, oh, if we, if we can address the problem, um, then, you know, we can move on with it. So if radiation exposure is the issue, uh, engineers can come up with a better way of protecting people, hence we can go again with nuclear energy, right? But uh, um, the keynote presentation yesterday made it clear that, you know, nuclear accident goes beyond uh, individual exposure um, or, you know, disintegration of um, molecular um, cells and why not, but also the disintegration of the social and domestic fabric, which we have no way of recovering. So I guess that's uh, enough for me to say, and I'm looking forward to hear what Professor Oak has to say. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rio. Um, yeah, so this is a little, um, I, well, first of all, I should say I, I had the advantage of of reading the paper, <laughs> um, and 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 the the ethnographic letter, I should say, um, in its entirety, and it's a it's a it's a lovely account of uh, that 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 manages to balance empathy, um, rigor, nuance, criticality, um, and accessibility all at the same time. And um, I'm going to offer some. I don't, you know, I don't really have a set of questions that I want to put to you um, as much as just some um, thoughts that were stimulated by reading this. Um, and some of that is a little bit selfish on my part, uh, just because I want to emphasize things that I found really interesting and exciting about what you were doing. And you might not find those things as interesting, but we'll see. Um, and I was, so I will just invite you to respond um, if you see fit. Um, to any of these comments, or if they jar any kind of additional thoughts or reflections on your part, um, and if not, that's that's fine. But I, I I really enjoyed reading this, and I want to express some of what kind of went through my mind as I was reading it. So, 
you know, one thing we've seen in all these accounts that we're, you know, that we're going to see later today, as well as um, last night, um, uh, uh, you know, about life in and around Fukushima over the past decade. And this is also reiterated in the film um, that uh, Sofakar, Sofakar did called um, Healing Fukushima, which um, he shared the link with us. And maybe we, maybe we can put that in the chat for the other people um, as well to, uh, to see it's, um, it's about an hour long and I, I watched it last night and I felt some of the same issues coming up in that film as well. And that is the overwhelming uncertainty of knowledge um, of people being forced to make decisions in relation to the unseen and hidden nature of harm and risk um, posed by radiation exposure. And so Rio's paper offers not simply a testimonial of this uncertainty, but more importantly, I think a way to confront and perhaps move beyond what Hero last night called the crisis of expertise following the 311 disaster. Um, that comes through an inversion of knowledge, I think, implied in Rio's ethnographic lettering format. Um, and this format involves several important positions, I think. Um, one is that we approach the field, the research endeavor, so to speak, um, from a position of vulnerability rather than expertise um, and as holders of knowledge. Um, while, that, while, while we may be trained to or have a desire to make visible via our knowledge uh, something that is invisible to others, um, we must ultimately make the effort to truly learn from our interlocutors. Um, and Rio's account is a marvelous example of that, I think. Um, it's the vernacular theorizing of our interlocutors that matters um, on how to live with radiation, uh, how to live an atomic livelihood, as he calls it, uh, and not just how to be a victim, um, a suspended refugee, so to speak. Another way of saying this is that the struggle for life in, in post-fallout Fukushima is not just a struggle with radiation, but as he suggests, a struggle over land. Uh, and here we see Rio's efforts to rearticulate the question um, of post-fallout life in settled, grounded terms that are empowered by connection to land, identity, history, uh, rather than the unsettled and disrupted terms of contamination that disempower and create victims. This is also a question of technopolitics, or as Rio terms it, half-life politics. Um, nuclear power does not just divide atoms. Uh, it's a technology that produces social divisions as well. Um, it's also, as he puts it, produces and reproduces a community of the exposable. Right? So, I mean, who is exposable? Who is not? These are deeply political questions generated by the nature of one's connection to the technologies of nuclear power infrastructure. 311 initiated a cascade of social disintegrations and divisions. Um, and in addition to these, these kind of this way of thinking about the technopolitical dimensions of, of what we're looking at, um, the disaster was also in turn rendered technical in simply, uh, you know, sorry, as, as simply a problem of contamination, a problem that then calls for a technical solution or response, evacuation, safety monitoring, so on. And this has had the abstracting effect of rendering people invisible by denying all of their previous identities, histories, and livelihoods. They become, in effect, vessels for contamination, either already contaminated or waiting to become contaminated. This state of being in relation to the contamination of airborne radiation can be called a condition of suspension. And that term suspension is, uh, is used in the title of, of Rio's paper, um, uh, which, you know, which, he, which is pursed lips, a, a call to suspend damage in the age of decommissioning. Um, and so I, I've been personally really interested in this idea of suspension for a while now because of the work that I have been doing on infrastructure. Um, but set, said a different way, the social disintegrations and divisions launched by the disaster um, produce a condition of suspension. 
government safety regulations, for example, hold people in, in this condition and during years, years of waiting. Now reorganizes his discussion around the temporal markers of already and still marking time in suspension or as he terms it, suspension of damage. Uh, these come in oscillating waves, uh, you know, already and still coming in off of os oscillating waves, uh, denying a linear accumulation of time um, that might otherwise be hoped for uh, in order to move through and beyond um, a situation of being evacuated and not being able to go back to your home and so on. Now here I'm reminded of the way suspension has come to be defined of, as a, a particular aspect of the temporalities of infrastructure. So, you know, for example, Akhil Gupta has noted that instead of being understood as a temporary state of bet, uh, being, you know, between the start of a project and its completion, suspension needs to be theorized as its own condition of being. The temporality of suspension is not between past and future, he says, but between, uh, sorry, between beginning and end, but instead constitutes its own ontic condition, just as surely as does completion. Uh, this ontic condition, uh, I would say, is one captured by, by the metaphor of an unstable mixture in which particles are carried within a fluid body of something else. In other words, the condition of, of suspension. Um, that fluid body might be thought of as government safety regulations or probably more accurately as the airborne isotopes themselves. Uh, recognizing that, that now we've kind of moved, this is no longer fluid, <laughs> but atmospheric. So work with me here. Um, but the metaphor of suspended particles in a, in a fluid or atmosphere um, suggests that suspension is not only temporal, but also spatial. Uh, it comes to, to define um, a spatial zone of exclusion or exception, uh, a space that remains uninhabitable in popular imagination, frozen in time. Uh, and here I'm reminded of Tchaikovsky's 1979 film, Stalker, um, which, uh, and sorry to go off on a little weird filmophile riff here, but um, you know, that film offered a stunning prelude to the nuclear exclusion zones of Chernobyl and ultimately Fukushima. Um, and the zone in the film you know, is a space of suspension, but also of desire. Um, inhabiting it, it perhaps becomes a secret to, the secret to breaking free of that suspension. But that's another discussion that we can nerd out over if we want to talk more about films. <laughs> um, but the, you know, the atmospheric nature of this condition takes us also to the work of Tim Choi and Jerry Z, who suggest that our study of the condition of suspension can be, quote, a way of posing the question of the present as an atmospheric condition rather than the expansion of anthropogenic powers, unquote. OK, so that's a little thick. But what, what I think they mean is, is, is to decenter our analysis or, or decenter our analytical focus on human agency such that we take on what they call an atmospheric form of thought and being, focusing on what it means to be in this air. In their case, the air is the warming atmosphere of the Anthropocene of, of climate change. Um, but they identify a thanatopolitics of compromised life, which includes not just the air of a warming planet, but also Cold War mushroom clouds, wind-blown radioactive isotopes, nuclear accidents, chemical leaks, um, and tear gas assaults on protesters, which we've been seeing quite a bit of this past year. All of these have been and are increasingly aspects of daily life in many parts of the world. And interestingly, Choi and Z asked the following question, which seems relevant to Rio's discussion and for Heroes Project as outlined last night as well. Um, quote, they, they ask, in a history of damages, might there lurk other ways of exploring atmosphere? The question of the atmospheric Anthropocene might just be reframed from who holds responsibility for the air's contents to what it means now to attend to those contents to conditions of and for being held and moved in air. So in other words, suspension can be an injunction to an art of noticing, of living in and thinking with atmospheres, their capacities and their contents. 
So I, I, um, <laughs> I suspect that Rio might reply that this conceptual embrace of a condition of suspension flies in the face of the desires of his interlocutors to be deposited back on their land. But it also might offer a framing that re recognizes the condition of suspension that is an increasingly normalized one. Uh, and this then raises key questions regarding the forces that have produced this condition in the first place. The TEPCOs, the state regulations, the needs of global capital. And that question is this, is suspension the, des the desired state of being for capital, for the state? That condition of consistent vulnerability um, and disempowerment. This is where the question of the struggle over land becomes acute. Um, this is a struggle that posits a connection to the land as perhaps a mediating condition of one's connection with the infrastructures of nuclear power. That is a way of making that connection variable and a way of shifting the condition of suspension to one of deposition. Okay, so one last point after that deep dive into some pretty abstract stuff. Um, I'm struck by the issue of place naming here that Rio raises uh, in his paper. And this is a little bit of a kind of an end note and aside, something like that. But, you know, is calling the 311 disaster Fukushima akin to calling COVID-19 the Chinese virus, um, the Spanish flu, you know, Ebola is named after a river in the Congo. Um, these are places that have forever been now kind of linked to contagion, to disaster. Um, and so, uh, so this is also, a, the struggle over land is a struggle over place, over place, sense of place, place naming, being in place. Um, and so my final thought is, is, is about this sense of place, thinking here of the work of my fellow human geographers like Doreen Massey, Tim Cresswell and others, and whether or not there is something to be gained from, an under, from understanding Naoko's struggle in terms of a politics of place, in addition to the technopolitics um, that we've been discussing. So um, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope those comments spur some uh, ideas and thoughts, but we'll see. Uh, Rio, I invite you to respond if you see fit. Otherwise, we can just go to some questions. Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, I guess, you know, I, I didn't mention in, in my own comments, but yes, I, I took an issue at basically declaring that uh, I would not consider uh, seriously the kind of work that only mentioned Fukushima <laughs> as a way to just talk about uh, issues here. This is just, you know, um, my personal uh, issue in the sense that the, um, have become um, tired of, um, you know, specialists talking just about Hokushima, but I have no idea where, um, because as somebody who did a field work, and I think, um, you know, other panelists uh, today uh, can probably attest to that, you know, the situation is very different and dependent in area, which is a cliche, but somehow have been forgotten. So I just wanted to um, bring more um, regard to our research uh, in terms of really specifying. And I, you know, and I think Colin accent, uh, not Hokushima accent, but TEPCO accent actually um, follows the, uh, probably the desire of TEPCO themselves, because they are <laughs> very uh, forthcoming about their responsibility for Hokushima. So if they so want to claim it, why don't we just give it to them? Is you know my way of thinking that. Uh, in terms of suspension, like I wasn't really thinking in the in the broader term that the, you're, you know, laid out, and especially uh, you know one of my colleagues Jerry Z, uh, talks uh, in terms of the atmosphere. Here uh, I'm talking more specific to um, the type of um, research uh, that's been done to the indigenous communities, and if talk call to. Uh, focus not just on the damage, uh, which in the process ended up just articulating the group of people as indeed damaged instead of um, providing the intervention to do something about the damage. And I'm just trying to think of, you know, some peril here in the sense of like, okay, well, if our goal is to establish the um, 
damaging effect of radiation and then exposure, then are we just doing the service to local residents who are willing to um, live uh, despite their awareness uh, of the potential threat? So I think here is something I, I noticed that in the Hiroko uh, was um, discussing a little bit about like, uh, you know, how, how should we position ourselves this is this um you know the residents and the coastal hokushima that is uh, is our job is to say you know to reveal some secret that that the corporations and the governments are hiding as a way to help uh, people the victims some kind of benefit or are we here to um, look at an alternative way, in a way to, you know, not to necessarily normalize, um, but to um, provide another way of engaging with um, this particular issue, which has been pretty much dominated by the narrative of, um, you know, radiation exposure, contaminations, and the way not. So, you know, suspension to me here is more specific to the, the kind of damage imagined um being done to this group of people and then thank you for um bringing up about this half-life politics um, this is something i'm trying to work on but i guess oftentimes that uh, people struggle uh understanding because of the life politics right <laughs> which is the mainstream thing um, by saying half-life politics i'm not really thinking about the human beings the, the life of human beings um, to bring the attention to the fact that the radioisotopes themselves are living things on, on their own, and then they have their own temporality, which, you know, in a way, uh, impact the way that we relate to them. So by saying half-life politics, I want to foreground the fact that when we focus on the different kind of species only, then um, we kind of neglect them why it was important to protect humans to begin with, right? So this is just like a still a work in process, but that's something that I'm working on. And then finally, I'll just say a little bit about this uh, thing about the uncertainty uh, of knowledge that you started the common with. And I think it's very important because one thing I realized is that with my encounter with um, people in coastal Hokushima, you know, I started to question uncertainty uncertainty for whom, right? So I had my own uncertainty going into this thing and I was expecting to find something and answer the question, but that didn't necessarily match with what people thought was uncertain in their life, which is when can I go back, right? So I'm coming in and it's like, why are you living or why are you trying to go back? And then people are like, well, I mean, I just want to know when I can go back. Right. So that like helped me to think like, well, you know, we often say like something is uncertain and that doesn't mean we're on the same page in terms of what is it that is uncertain. Right. So we need to take one more step to kind of think about, you know, what we mean when we say something is uncertain and for whom. Um, because what I've realize is that the you know, uncertainty also changes in the sense that the, as people live, you know, something becomes more certain, right? Which doesn't mean like other things becomes also certain, like other things might become uncertain, but it just changes as well, like the, you know, the already instilled kind of temporality too. So, you know, that's, that's uh, one thing I wanted to comment, but uh, other than that, I think, um, Thank you so much for your comments. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, we can open it up. Uh, we have a few minutes um, for questions. Uh, just I'll invite panelists, I'll invite other wor uh, workshop participants to raise a hand or just jump in with a question. Um, uh, otherwise people can enter comments or questions in the chat as well. Um, Hariko. Yeah, so. Um, Yes, yeah, so uh, so so thank you very much for for that um, paper, and I, I really enjoyed reading it. It was really quite um, um, touching, 
and um, you know, subtle. And um, as Tim was saying, it really you know brings to life a lot of the issues uh, that are about it. Um, I I just have a comment about the the naming of the accident, as both you and um, Tim were talking about, because um, this is something that I actually struggled with in terms of naming my own work, because. Um, um, I think, you know, particularly in the early days of talking about the uh, Fukushima crisis, Fukushima accident, um, there was certainly a hesitancy to name it as Fukushima because not, as, not only is um, Fukushima is the name of lots of things like the prefecture and the city, and then the, and there are actually two different nuclear power plants that have the name of Fukushima. And um, it has the same kind of problem that Hiroshima and Nagasaki both have, where there are also cities and prefectures and sites of atomic disasters. And um, in Japanese, um, people have gotten around that naming issue by writing Hiroshima or Nagasaki in katakana. And I've seen some people do that for Fukushima, but with some sort of hesitancy. But uh, I know that at least for myself, I didn't want to uh, call my work to be about 311 because 311 is also inclusive of the earthquake and tsunami. And um, doing relief work or talking about um, you know, disaster aspects of the earthquake and tsunami was never really controversial, whereas talking about the nuclear disaster was always controversial. So I did want to make sure that people knew that I was talking specifically about the Fukushima nuclear accident and I think um, earlier on in my work, I called it the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident or the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant accident or something like that. And my editor said, that's not going to make a good book title. <laughs> so it ended up just being Fukushima on my book. But I, I do feel quite self-conscious about that, actually, simply because I, I do recognize, as Tim was saying, and as Sanrio was saying, that um, it, it does make... Fukushima, the index of that accident, which is very unfortunate. So I, I would also like to name it the TEPCO accident. No, I mean, th thank you. You know, I, it, this is just like I'm saying, like I, I'm calling it that I'm not saying like, well, if anybody else call it something else, like I don't take you seriously, nothing like that. Um, but I, I think just to me, it's just a rhetorical in the sense that the, my argument being, right, how, this allowed us to sort of slack in some of the details about Fukushima. Um, and, you know, by calling it a technical accident will open a different spaces for me to engage, which is my ethnographic work, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not to say like, well, I want to make this <laughs> the yeah. official name. And then, you know, as somebody in, in the, you know, Western academia, I'm aware that, you know, it's better to just say Fukushima for people to understand, right? Because yeah. if if I want to say TEPCO first, I have to spell everything out, and then, right? So, um, but I, I think it just it's just the personal thing for me, so mm. that I can think about um, what is it that being erased by just um, calling a big chunk of land is one thing, right? So it, it's my thought experiment, but nothing to blame others for doing that stuff. So don't, don't please don't worry about it. Yeah, but uh, it is something that I struggled with myself. So it was interesting for me to see that. Uh, Hiroko. Yeah, I really appreciate that conversation. And thank you, Ryo, for for the very thoughtful talk and, and the letter that um, you, you wrote. Um, so yeah, just to kind of jump in on that um, conversation about the naming and I actually joined in on your experiment, Rio, after um, we were in a panel, I think two weeks ago. And um, I, you'll probably, you'll see in my paper that I say TEPCO's nuclear accidents um, in Fukushima. Um, but then I started wondering, um, since I listened to um, Hiro's talk yesterday, you know, where the, one of the problems is that TEPCO is the sole blame and that itself is, you know, the, the kind of problem that Hiro is trying to deal with. And then I started wondering, well, well, how should I, you know, how does that change the way I might call this um, this disaster, this accident? Um, that's kind of a side note, but um, yeah, just so thank you so much for that, um, bringing that up. Um, another reason I'm very thankful for that is, um, and we've talked a little bit about this here, but um, one of the kind of formative work for me uh, as I was writing my dissertation, which I defended in the summer, was that um, the to 
to kind of read Eve Tuck's work in suspending damage. Um, and I should probably foreground that um, I that was very important for me because I was, you know, as the disaster happened, I was in the US as a college student. And I'm from Fukushima. I was born in Fukushima. So I have that mark on my passport, you know, birth, place of birth. And suddenly, you know, no one knew about Fukushima. And suddenly everyone's talking about it in a certain way. And it was that kind of discrepancy that really wanted me to not do work uh, on Fukushima, but also feel like I, I should do work um, to do the kind of suspending damage work. So I just want to say how much I appreciate um, that work that you're doing. Um, and um, my question, I just had a question about what your sense is about what makes damage-centered narrative something that's so attractive for disaster-affected sites and also particularly for Fukushima. And I think one obvious reason is because, you know, social justice frameworks, as well as compensation, requires to, um, to, like injury and damage as evidence. Um, and then I was thinking again with Hero's talk yesterday and I, I thought that the fact that the lawyers working with um, the Namia residents, they actually didn't file a lawsuit based on injury or health effects. They didn't wait until the health effects appeared and they did um, something more about the livelihood of the ways of life that was lost. And I thought that was, you know, it just really made me, made me think that that might be like a very important step in the work of suspending damage to open up that conversation that's really not about radiation and its health effects. Um, so part of the question is really asking, you know, what kind of damage are we trying to kind of count, count or really push back against? And in my thinking, I think it's really the specific ways that nuclearity, the exceptionality of being nuclear is being um, created in the US, but also in Japan in distinct ways. And how do we work with perhaps the distinct ways that um, it's being done and also the common ways it's being done? So that's just the question of why you think damage-centered narrative is so attractive. Well, no, thank you so much. Um, and if you had noticed, I, I started just saying, dam you know, suspending damage. And then in the end of my paper, I say suspending radiological damage, right? So I myself was kind of thinking about, like, what do I mean by damage? So I think there's so, you know, a lot of work and fine tuning to be done in terms of really defining what we mean by damage. I think to me, you know, right now it was easier because I, in a way, was able to set stuff up and say like, you know, it's clear that what I'm against, right? But I think as I work more about it, I think need to be more specific to um, what kind of damage I'm talking about. But to answer your uh, question, this is something like I've been struggling since 2011 as, you know, quote unquote disaster researcher, because um, there's always this issue or concern about, uh, you know, researchers themselves being a disaster capitalist in a way that collecting narratives of sufferings and losses in a way we're gaining stuff, right? You know, we can say like, well, I'm, like telling this to outside of Japan, so I'm doing something for you. But at the same time, there is always this sense of like, well, what's the way I can just actually return in something to the people that I worked with to allow me to, you know, you know, share their life, right? And it, and I think this genre of ethnographic lettering itself is my attempt to kind of think about, you know, okay. And especially after writing the abstract, I was like, what am I saying? <laughs> you know, who am I writing this to? And then who, you know, does this serve, right? And then that sort of made me think about like, well, what if like I write it like I would talk to somebody, right? <laughs> and then Lawrence, you know, had yeah, this framework. So I kind of like tried it myself. I mean, it's not the real um, method like, you know, he um, teaches um, because it's not like, um, you know, the group of people and in the long-term conversation, it's more one-on-one, -on -one, but I kind of wanted to um, signal to the fact that I actually learned something and I wanted to speak back in the way that, you know, if I translate this, that people can understand like, what I'm trying to say. Um, and I think this is another way to think about, you know, I think you, you had a question about like, well, what's the way we can relate to this, right? 
And so this is another way of thinking about, you know, I think a researcher um, in general, like we always need to be careful or, you know, mindful about the extractive nature of our work, um, not just because of discipline anthropology as having the colonial thing, but it's just the form of knowledge making is always a dialogical, right? So you are taking somebody else's stuff to it. And, and then, you know, one more thing I want to add is that, you know, something, um, you know, we could probably say disaster pornography, <laughs> that is the sensationalism self. And unfortunately, this this just is the case. You know, if I give a talk about like, well, how like I, you know, uncover some, you know, mutations of plants, I probably get more hit than if I say, you know, oh, there's no danger, right? So this is something like, um, there's no way we can just deal with it. So um, I guess, um, I guess like, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I really need to think about the way with other people to really think about or not to just fall into the trap of, you know, um, shining because of this, this work. <laughs> You know, that is, I need to accept that so some of the stuff is boring or might not be exciting to other people, but at least I'm trying to, you know, prevent some people I know from pursing their lips, so to speak, you know, and, it, and then hence, like, I actually ended up changing the title because I wanted something like visual as a way to sort of, uh, you know, go with like what it means to suspend damage you know what if like you know less people person their lips you know that means they're maybe more willing to talk maybe isn't that you know what i want because when it comes to the issue of contamination people just don't want to talk because you know people want to avoid disagreement right but what if it becomes okay for people to be able to just say all sorts of things about it, but they feel safe, right? And then at least I thought that's the kind of environment I, my scholarship would like to provide. And then, but you know, the question remains about you know defining what the damage is. But I think it only begins if we can help people to be able to discuss what is it that they're feeling are being impacted by so but you know thank you so much for the question but i think we both probably need to work on this <laughs> okay thanks uh here um uh, rio i gavin i see your raised hand but we we're, we are going to have to move along to try to keep somewhat on schedule we're a little over uh time um so i would invite you gavin to put your question in the chat if that's okay um and perhaps rio can um we can address it directly in chat or, or you know at least we'll see it there so apologies for not